Welcome everyone to today's Art and Me. We're going to get started in just a minute. So in the meantime, take a second to settle in, look at the artworks that you see on the screen and think about what do you see in these artworks? Type in the chat or the Q&A. We're gonna put the supplies that you got in the email in the chat. This is a good time to gather them if you haven't already. Please ask us any questions and just think about here what you are seeing on the screen. There are several artworks up. And keep in mind as we get started that this webinar is going to be recorded for educational purposes. We do have closed captioning, which you can turn on or off on your screen. And we really encourage you to ask your questions throughout this program. So please be as chatty as you'd like with us using the Q&A or the chat feature. So in looking here, let's take a look and see if there are any questions or what people are seeing in these artworks. I see, let's see here. I see someone says they see a butterfly. And I see a butterfly too. And I'm wondering here, Leah or Ellen, do you know anything about the butterfly piece as we get started? I do, yes. I'm so glad that someone noticed that. This is one of my favorite pieces. So this is from the Renwick collection, which is part of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And that amazing butterfly piece is made out of buffalo horn. It was made by Kevin and Valerie Purrier, who are from South Dakota. They're Aguala Lakota, and um, they live on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And so this amazing piece is made out of horn. And what they do is cut teeny tiny, really specific and really detailed lines that they cut out of the buffalo horn. And then those colors are actually made out of stones. So it's made of inlaid, orange sandstone and mother of pearl. So it looks like it's painted, but it's not painted. Actually, all of those colors and the butterfly pattern is made out of stone that they put into that buffalo horn. So it's really amazing. How fun. I'm seeing some other chats here. A lot of people are seeing different types of bugs, um, which is perfect. Um, someone noticed this, this worm down here. <laughs> That's also from the American Art Museum where I work. And that is an adorable little caterpillar. And it's actually a watercolor. So it's a watercolor painting. And it was made um, by Emma Beach Thayer, who was from New York. She lived in the late 1800s. And that was kind of a sketch for a book that she was illustrating about bugs. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think we can get started now that everyone's looked at some some creepy crawlies as our work to see and all the different artworks from our different collections. So thank you everyone for joining us for today's Art and Me Preservation Family Workshop that is co-hosted by the National Museum of Asian Art and the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Lunder Conservation Center. I am Laura Hoffman. I am the L a Lunder Conservation Center volunteer at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. We say SAM for short, and I have the pleasure to work alongside Leah. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Laura. Um, so like Laura said, I am at the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Lunder Conservation Center, and I am an objects conservator, um, which is basically like an art doctor, but for three-dimensional artworks, so sculpture and baskets and things like that, which is the same job that um, Ellen does, but at a different museum. Ellen, do you want to introduce yourself next? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Ellen, and I am also an objects conservator like Leah, but I work at the National Museum of Asian Art, which is another Smithsonian museum. Um, and so I think first we're going to talk a little bit about what a conservator is. And just before we do, we want to say normally if you come to our programs, we're all we're also joined by Matthew, and he couldn't make this one, but um, he is here in spirit and helped us design the whole program. So you'll yeah. see him at a future program. Okay. So 
I don't know if some of you have come before or if you've heard the word before, but we'd love to know if any of you know what a conservator is. So if you have an idea of what that might mean, go ahead and write it in the Q&A. Um, and we'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Um, and if you don't know, take a look at this picture. This is a picture of Leah working with an object. So, so take a look at the picture of her and see what kinds of things you notice. And those would be great things to add to the chat as well. Um, and I know Le Leah gave a little hint earlier. She said something about us being art doctors. So maybe think about what that might mean. Um, and we'll give you a couple of minutes to type stuff in before we talk about it. Not minutes, sorry, if you, not quite that long. <laughs> but if you, a little chance to write something. Um, Ellen, someone wrote that they saw that Leah was wearing gloves in this picture. Right, right. That is a very good observation. So one of the things uh, when we are art conservators, um, we what a conservator does is we work with the art and we try and keep it safe and understand what's going on with it. And so we have different tools that we use. And so right now, Leah is working with something. And so she's wearing gloves. And I have gloves just like that. Mine are purple, though. But we wear gloves like this. And what that does is it protects your hands, even when you wash your hands really well, um, there are oils on your hands that come naturally. And for some art objects, it can damage the art. And so we wear gloves to protect the artwork. And the other thing is that we wear the gloves for in the other direction, because sometimes the materials that we use to treat the art, to work with the art, to take care of it um, can hurt our, our skin. So we also wanna protect ourselves. And if you'll notice, I don't know if you guys can see, can you see what I'm wearing? What, does this look familiar to anybody? This, this thing, that, the white thing that I'm wearing, does anyone know what that is? Okay, this is, it's called a lab coat, but sometimes you'll see if you go to the doctor's office, sometimes doctors will wear white coats like this. And we, as conservators, when we're working with objects, we also wear coats like this sometimes um, for kind of similar reasons, but you can think, if you can think of any reason why, go ahead. Otherwise I will um, tell you. So, um, we wear it both to, again, just like the gloves to protect the artwork. Like if I'm wearing a fuzzy sweater, I don't really want to get fuzzies all over the art, right? But also like the gloves, we wear it to protect ourselves if we're working with paint or chemicals. And I don't know if you can see very easily, but I am not so good at keeping paint off of me. So I have a lot of paint on my lab coat. So it, for me, I like wearing my lab coat. <laughs> um, and if you look, another thing that Leah is doing is that she's looking at the artwork very closely because the first thing that we do when we work with art is we want to do really close looking to understand what we're looking at. Just like the doctor, you go and they examine you and they ask you questions. Well, artwork doesn't talk. So for us, we need to look really carefully to understand what kind of things we need to do to keep the artwork safe. And then just as a quick one, this is helping to magnify. So sometimes we wear things like that to be able to see things better. And Leah and I will talk about tools a little bit more later, but right now she's going to start telling you a little bit more about the topic of our session today. And I just went to the doctors and they used something very similar to that. So I did, I did think of you two as my art doctors. All right, so this is a good time to gather your materials. Again, I just put that in the chat here because we are going to get started on our art project. So today we're gonna create our own creepy crawly because we're talking all things bugs today. So again, this seems like a lot of materials, but it's very open and flexible. Um, we recommend you could use paint, um, you can use scissors, glue tape. Um, I decided to use markers instead of paint. So that's a good option too egg carton, paper plate, cupcake liners, bottle caps, popsicle sticks. You can use pipe cleaners, chenille stems, googly eyes, pom-poms, tracing paper. I mean, honestly, anything is the limit here. So I'll show you what I used for it based on what I had lying around. So I'm gonna stop this for a second here so that I can show you better. Okay, so let me know in this, in the chat if also you have trouble seeing. So what we're going to do is I'm starting, again, you can use whatever you'd like. I have an egg card and basically what you want to start out with is whatever is gonna be the body of your creepy crawly. So it can be something based on a real bug that you've seen or something that you're dreamed up in your head. So think about whatever you'd like to do. Paper plates work really well for this, bottle caps. Um, I have some bottle caps here. so. You can really do anything. What I decide to do is I had a bunch of egg cartons lying around. So I cut out a few, so this would be my body. Then again, you don't have to do it this way, uh, but I have 
some chenille stems or pipe cleaners. So I'm going to use these because the creepy crawly legs. But what you do want to do is you want to work together both the adults and the kids because I needed to use scissors. And what I want to do is I want to poke them through here. So I'm going to need to use the scissors to poke with the hole. Have an adult do this. Do not have a kid do this. So you puncture through. If you want, you can also use tape or glue. I also have glue here. And then you're just gonna cut through and feed through however you like. This is one example. We're gonna show you a bunch of different examples throughout this, both from our art museums, as well as from our own examples. So again, if this doesn't look like the body or how you wanna do your artwork, that is okay. Then what I like to do is draw some eyes because I didn't have any googly eyes, but if you had those, that would be very fun. I also decide with my markers that I would color around and make some designs. So doing some movie magic, I was playing around here and this wound up being my little creepy crawly. So it's kind of inspired by nature, but also it's definitely something I dreamed up. I used a lot of different colors here. I used purples and pinks. Um, two different colors for the different legs. I decided to kind of give this interesting, almost eyebrows, maybe also antenna, who knows, could be both. So you can really have some fun with it. So let me know in the chat if you have any questions, but keep tinkering away and we're gonna look at more examples as you think about them. At the end of the program, we're gonna offer to do a show and tell. So if you want to share, the artworks that you're creating, we'll put them up on the screen. So I'll put in the chat the email address that you can email them to, and you can do that anytime in the program. So now let me go back to the screen so we can look at some more examples. And here's the directions in case, but just know that we have this. This is all going to be saved and emailed out to you after, so you have it. All right. And Leo, why don't you tell us about some examples from Smithsonian American Art Museum? Oh, right. I'm so excited. This is a great place to start talking about bugs. Um, in this photo, you may not really be able to see all the details, but take a look and think about what might be decorating the walls of this gallery. This is in the Renwick Gallery. This was back in 2015. And this artist decorated a whole room with something very specific that we might be talking about today. <laughs> so if you can think of what she might have used to create those designs on the walls, go ahead and put it in the chat or in the Q&A. And then the next slide, we'll see some more details, but we can stay on this one for a second. So you can look closely and think about what designs you see can you see any different colors? Um, Leah, somebody says they see skulls on the wall. <gasps> yes, I see that too. There are some skulls on the wall, good observation. Lots of designs. Can anyone think of what she might have used to create those? Oh, flowers. Yes, someone said flowers. Good call. What might be making those petals, the flower petals? Anyone have an idea? Or see some bright colors? This is a really fun artwork and a great place to start today. Laura, I don't know if you wanna go on to the next one. We can see some details. We can look more closely at the walls. And now you can see more clearly what Jennifer, the artist, used to make those skulls and those flowers designs on the wall. She actually used bugs. And a lot of people who visited this gallery, they didn't think that they were real bugs, but they're actually all real bugs that Jennifer got. She used to live in, in Southeast Asia, so in Thailand and Malaysia, and all of these bugs are from that part of the world. So there are lots of bright colors and I live here in Washington, DC, and I don't see a lot of these kinds of bugs very often, <laughs> but they're very cool. Uh, um, what kind of colors do you see? I know Laura was saying that she thought her, her little homemade bug, maybe sort of nature, 
sort of just from her imagination. And a lot of these books to me seem like they maybe came out of someone's imagination, but they are totally real bugs. She didn't paint them. They're completely found in nature. Someone sees the color blue, black. And I see someone else noted that they see the color pink. So there are lots of different colors in here. Exactly. Pink, blue, black. There's some yellow and even some orange, like the monarch butterflies that we saw in that first slide. So, <clears throat> excuse me, bugs all around the world can come in so many shapes and sizes and colors. And they can even be used to make colors. So that bright pink that you see on the wall, she didn't, Jennifer didn't use that just because she likes the color. She loves the color, but she also used it specifically because that color was made out of bugs. And so we can go to that next slide and see the bug that made that color. Um, sorry, I should have warned you if you're a little sensitive to bugs, <laughs> um, but these tiny little bugs are called cochineal. And um, they're, they're found in the Southwestern United States and in Mexico, and they live on cactuses, on cacti. And it's only the girl bugs that when they're dried and kind of mushed up, they create this bright red color. And that color can be used like we saw in Jennifer's artwork, it can be used as a paint or it can be used as a dye to color textiles and fabrics, just like in this beautiful painting that you see on the slide that's from China. The colors of the, the robe that he's wearing, some of the pinks and reds were made out of the same kind of dye. So cochineal bugs and all kinds of bugs have been used to make art materials for a long, long time and still used today. Leah, uh -huh. uh, we have a question that is asking, maybe I'll just go back, which is how do the bugs stay on the wall here? Oh, that's a really good question. So Jennifer uses pins to stick into the wall to secure the bugs to the wall because she actually tries to use them for lots of different installations. So she doesn't want them to, she doesn't glue them, she doesn't want them to stick and then not be able to come off. So she uses little pins to secure them that then she can very take, carefully take off and use the bugs as much as she can for another show. Does that make sense? It's a great question. Yeah. I, know, I never even thought about that. I know, it's a great question. Yeah. So is, it, is it like the insect pins that, that would, you would use if you were taking care of specimens in another, like at the Natural History Museum? Oh, okay, cool. I think so, I think so. Mm -hmm. You can't even see them. I know, so you can imagine how much time that would have taken mm -hmm. to do, to put this whole artwork together. Cool. Yeah. All right, can go back. Okay, so sometimes, you know, I get scared of bugs. Sometimes I don't like bugs, they're creepy, but they can also be used to make beautiful artworks and have been used in artworks for a very long time and make really bright colors. So think about that when you're making your own little bug. Before we move on, we did get another question about the installation. Oops. Um, could you specify the different bugs in this installation? Oh, goodness. Unfortunately, I am not a very, <laughs> not a bug expert. <laughs> um, I'm sure that if you, um, actually, I don't know if it's on our website, if she identifies all of those bugs, um how about Leah if you find out you know yeah. you can always put them that in the chat and mm -hmm. otherwise we'll follow up and see because that's yeah really we can put it mm -hmm. it's a great question some of these bugs are really wild so that would be fun to know but I unfortunately do not all right sometimes you get really good questions and it makes for a good research question for us it's a good question all right Oh, a lot of questions about this. Another person's asking, did the bugs die naturally? I, I don't I, I don't know if you know this. So she does she does talk about this um, when Jennifer, when she talks about her artwork, um, that generally she tries to, she purchases the bugs from like vendors um, in that part of the world. And um, she used to always purchase them. I think they some of them die naturally and sometimes um, they have been farmed so there's some of these bugs that are um they're like 
not just in the middle of the jungle and people find them, but there's like farmed bugs um, that are actually better for the environment because they don't um, require harvesting, harvesting from them from the natural world. And so Jennifer said that she tries to use those farmed insects whenever she can, um, but she doesn't always. So I think I think sometimes they die naturally and people find them and sometimes they're, they're don't, which is kind of sad, but you know. Another question was asked, are the dyes permanent? So oh, wow, what a good question. <laughs> so cochineal and all kinds of dyes um, can be affected by things like light exposure. So they're not necessarily permanent. Cochineal is actually pretty strong um, and it lasts a long time. But if something like this beautiful painting were to be left in front of a window for years and years, it would fade a lot. And that beautiful color would disappear because it would get faded by the sunlight. So we do have to be pretty careful about that. And the ex exhibition at the Renwick was not permanent and it is now a new show. So all of those bugs and the, the paint was removed or painted over. And that's a good question for an art doctor to, to think about what things are permanent, what does permanent mean in an artwork? So that's a really good question to ask. Yeah. Oh, and we just got in the chat saying that um, seeing some flies and caterpillars. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We do. We have some bug experts of our own watching today. Very good. All right. Great job. And so now we know that bugs can be really beautiful and part of artworks in our museum. But bugs, we also, as art doctors, have to be careful about bugs because they can do bad things in a museum, like munch on the artworks and damage them. Um, and I don't know about you, but dogs are one of my favorite things in the entire world. So I am very excited to get to talk about a dog. <laughs> um, can you guys think of something that dogs are really good at that they might be used in a museum? What's something, what are some skills that only dogs have? particularly this kind of dog. This is a Weimaraner. Any ideas? I know that they can hear really well and see. Someone said bones. Bones, oh yes, that's so true. My dog is really good at hiding bones. <laughs> she loves them. <laughs> but not just hiding bones, also like sniffing and smelling them, right? Totally, yeah, she can find them anywhere. Yeah, she'll sniff them out. And that is definitely what Riley, who is this dog here, Riley has a really good nose and he has been trained since he was a tiny puppy to be good at sniffing out bugs. So he helps the art doctors and other people at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, he helps keep the bad bugs out of the museum to keep them from munching on all the artwork. And we, in the, the Q&A, they said dogs can warn people not to touch the artwork. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes, I like that. <laughs> we should employ some more security dogs to have just like nudge people to remind them not to touch the artwork. That's a great idea. That would be a very good boy. <laughs> yes. Oh, that would be fun. That, maybe that should be my new job is to train museum dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I love it. But yes, Riley, the museum dog, is specifically trained to look for bugs, just like we're talking about today. And if you see in there, there's actually a children's book, yeah. The Adventures of Riley. So if you want to learn more about Riley, you can read all about it. Yep, so Riley can help us look for bugs, but there's also other ways that art doctors keep an eye out for bugs and make sure that they don't damage our collections. And that is what Ellen is going to talk about next. So I love the idea of a, a dog that sniffs out bugs, but we don't have one. So, so we do lots of other things to make sure that the bugs that might hurt art work um, are not, don't come into our museums. And some of the main things we do are similar to the kinds of things you might do in your house, right? So we always, we try and make sure that all of the art storage areas and the areas where the art is exhibited stays really clean because a lot of bugs are attracted to things like, dust and dirt and mold and things that if you don't clean very much, you'll get more bugs. So that's one of the first things we do. And then we always inspect, we walk around and we look and we check and see if we see any bugs anywhere. And we have um, 
little traps to try and help us monitor if bugs are around. And every once in a while we do find a bug and then what kind of bug it is really makes a difference because some bugs won't hurt artwork, but other bugs will. So one of the first things that we wanna do, just as someone was asking earlier, what kind of bugs were in that artwork? Well, the thing that we wanna do when we find a bug in a museum is figure out as soon as we can, what kind of bug it is, if it would affect any artwork, and if so, what kind of artwork. And so this is, um, if you guys want to explore this a little more, this is actually one of the um, websites that I use a lot. It's called museumpests.net. There are lots of other things. And also because we're the Smithsonian, we're really lucky. And we have a lot of specialists who know all about insects. So I will also ask them, but, but sometimes I'll look at this website and you can see this is just one page. There's pages and pages and there's ways to identify it. And it tells you all about different bugs that might interact with artwork. It'll tell you if it's high risk, meaning that, th that there might be a lot of damage to the artwork. Um, and so it's a really good way for us to understand what kind of bug we found. Um, the other thing we do, not just looking for bugs, but Laura, if you could go to the next slide, please. We also do things to make sure that bugs aren't coming into the collection to begin with. So if you look, the, um, the artwork on a, the left is a carpet that we got not too long ago, a few years ago. And things like wool um, are very susceptible. They're often bugs with wool. So before any kind of wool comes into our collection, we, we freeze it. Um, and so you can see on the right, I don't know, do you notice anything about what those people, what, what those people are wearing that seem a little unusual to you? Take a look and see if you, especially the person in the front, do you see any kind of clothing that that person is wearing that looks a little um, different than what you might expect? Gloves. Yes. So if you look closely, that person is wearing a hat and gloves because that big room is a freezer. And so what we do when you freeze something, it won't hurt the artwork, but it will, um, it will um, prevent any eggs that might be or other bugs that might be in the artwork from, from growing and attacking that artwork or anything else. So anytime we have something new coming into the collection, we like this, we will freeze it. And there are other ways that you can do it as well, but all of them specifically focus on keeping people safe so that the people working with it aren't gonna get harmed and also keeping the artwork safe and then preventing any bugs from coming into our collection. So go ahead, can you go to the next one, please, Laura? And so now we hope that you guys have had some time to sort of think about what kinds of bugs you wanna create. And even if you haven't finished yet, that's okay. Just if you've gotten started, um, and um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of talk a little bit about our bugs and then talk about how as conservators, we might look at an artwork. And so while we're doing that, you can go ahead and finish up what you're doing. Um, or if you're ready, you can start sending Laura um, your pictures of bugs to the email address she put in the chat. But so I know you guys have seen the one on the left already because Laura showed you that earlier, that is her spectacular artwork. And then Leah didn't have a chance to put hers in the presentation, but Leah, do you want to hold up your bugs for um, in the um, screen so everybody can see? Sure. Them? Here's my first one that I wanted to make nice and colorful. I don't know if you can see. Um, he is orange and has black eyes. And I used a paper clip to make the little antenna and some little decorations with uh, tissue paper. And there's also pink polka dots because, of course. Um, and then I have another one that I wanted to make something that looked kind of like an ant. So I used another piece of an egg carton. And instead of just using one, like I did for this one, I used three and kept them together like little parts of a little ant. And he has some yellow on him too. Those are my bugs. Yeah. I love those. Thank you, Leah. And then the other one on the other side is the bug that I made. And so I used a little bit different materials, but some of the similar ones. So my body is made out of a, a toilet paper roll, half of a toilet paper roll. And then my eyes, I glued beads. And then the wings are made with paper and pipe cleaners. Sorry, chenille stems. <laughs> and, then, and then the antenna are also made from them. And so what we're gonna do on the next slide, and I think you guys got this emailed out to you, but if you didn't, it doesn't matter. You can just follow along on the screen. Because one of the things we're going to look at this like we would look at an artwork in the museum. So maybe like like the artworks made out of bugs. What would we do? How would we look at them? And what would we think about them? Um, how we take care of them. So the first thing we put on whenever we do a report, the first thing we do is we write our name on it so that if anyone has any questions, they can come ask us if they're reading the report. 
And then the next thing we do is we want to make sure to identify or tell the name or something about the artwork so that we know what we're writing about, right? So, so sometimes we call we have things called accession numbers. So we give each object a number. And so a lot of the time it's the year that it came into the collection and then when when during that year. So I just made this, right? So I'm gonna call this, say that this number is 2022.1. And for the name, I think I'm gonna call it flying insect. So if you guys have any ideas of different names that you think we should call it, or you wanna tell us some of the names of your artworks, that would be great. Go ahead and put it in the Q and A or in the chat. Um, and then once we have our name and we know who's examining it, we're gonna take a look and we're gonna describe the artwork, right? So if you guys could help me write my report, that would be really great. So, so take a look at the artwork and we need to have words that describe it. What are the best words that could help describe this artwork? Take a look and think about it and maybe put some in the chat for me. That would be really helpful. You want to help me do my report. I see uh, sparkly. Right, that's true because the pipe cleaners are, are kind of glitter pipe cleaners. They're sparkly pipe cleaners. Exactly. And what else do you notice about the wings on here? See, they're uh, pink. Pink, yep. yes, the wings are pink. Um, and you could also talk about the eyes. What do you notice about the eyes or the body? Do you guys see anything else? Green. Green, right. The eyes are green and the antennas are green. And so you could also write about what kind of materials they are, because sometimes it's really helpful to know how something's made. So just like Leah was talking about the materials, the different kinds of dyes and things and what kinds of bugs, if we know what something's made of, it helps us take care of it. So I might also write cardboard. The eyes are made of beads, right? Great. So I would say beads. I could put all different kinds of materials like that. And then the next section is to say which emoji best describes how you felt making the art. So for me, I really had fun making this. I had a great time making the wings. I had a really good time. So I would put a big smiley face, I think. But there are lots of different ways. You might have felt pretty cool about what you did, right? So you could do the sunglasses one for your artwork. And then the other thing we need to think about is how would we take care of the art, right? So we always look at it. We want to understand what kind of condition it's in, you know, if it's, if it's falling apart, if it's not falling apart. But we also want to know once we know what the condition is, how we're going to take care of it. So think about what are some of the things we might have talked about? How could we keep this piece of artwork safe? So, you know, it, that paper, sometimes there are bugs that sometimes um, attack paper. So I would want to be careful about making sure that I didn't put this someplace where bugs might be able to get to it because I wouldn't want the bugs to eat my bug. Um, um, Ellen, someone said, uh, put it in a cold place. Oh, yes, yes, very good, exactly. Um, so, and in fact, um, you don't necessarily have to keep it in a cold place all the time. Although we do have certain artworks, we do keep cold all the time to keep them safe, um, which is a different video, which you guys can go watch if you're interested, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's also true. Very true. So make sure there are no bugs with it to start with. And so then, um, the last part is for you guys, if you want, you can draw a picture of it. And so we've been talking about this bug as, um, as a piece of art, but we also can think about it if we want to, because we're each creating our own bugs or thinking about bugs as what our bug might do. So I was thinking that I would like my bug to be a bug that is um, helpful to artwork, not necessarily one that might eat it. So I don't think it's necessarily gonna be part of artwork, but I was thinking that maybe we could tell this is a mold bug. So if there's mold around, it might eat the mold, but it won't eat the artwork. But it means that if I see this bug, I know we have a mold problem. So this bug is kind of like Riley. It helps me detect problems in the art collection. Um, so that's how I am inventing my bug, what I want my bug to be. But now we would love to hear about some of your bugs. Yes, all right. So as we take a closer look here, I'm gonna put again the Share your artwork with us by email us a picture now at dwrclunder at si.edu. And we're, gonna, we're monitoring it so we can do the show and tell at the end right now. Um, but also, we want to ask you to think about what insects do you see outside? Have you ever seen bugs inside your home? I know I have. Um, especially around this time of year. And so I'm always thinking about how, how would we protect 
our artwork from these bugs if we're inside here. So think about that. Um, I'm going to stop the share right now and also stop the recording for the show and tell part. So for everyone on the recording, thanks so much for joining us, but for the show and tell, stay on. <laughs>